again, welcome back to The History Rescuer. My name is India and I'm going to be talking to you today about something that, once again, is a bit of a historical niche, but uh, hopefully you guys enjoy it. So, guess what? Recycling is not a new concept. The concept of recycling may seem new to modern society, but the truth is that it's far from it. In fact, for the vast majority of human history, societies big and small have been doing everything within their power to reduce, reuse, and recycle. The fundamental premise behind it is that, for the majority of human history, resources have been difficult to get, but time has been plentiful. So being able to use your time effectively to garner the resources that you have and recreate things out of old resources was the most efficient way to survive and live your life. It's only been in about the space of a single generation in the 20th century that that has been flipped on its head. Oh, we can all see how well that went. So in honor of the rebirth of a fantastic grand historic tradition, I would like to talk to you about some of my favorite moments of ingenuity throughout the history of recycling. And today I'm going to talk about World War II and the sheer scale of mobilization in regards to recycling and how that actually played a fundamental role in the success or failure of nations in World War II. Save your cans. Every can saved is a bullet in the gun of our best man is one of the many phrases that was used to promote the idea of recycling and collecting of all kinds of materials, large and small. So during World War II, almost every nation involved in the conflict did at some point or other a drive for resources and collections from the public. Whether that was metal resources and huge drives were done throughout the US and through the UK and Australia to collect up any and all scrap metal to be repurposed into tanks and bullets and grenades and any and all kinds of uh, vehicles of death and destruction. Um, there was also big collection drives for paper resources and they were so successful in the US that after three weeks they actually had to stop the drive altogether because their paper mills were inundated with material and it wasn't until a couple of years later that they had to reinstate that drive. Um, even down to things like rubber collections and the collections of plastic so that they could be reformed into tires for airplanes. One particular uh, collection that I find particularly interesting is the collection of nylon stockings in World War II. So nylon is a material that was only developed a few years prior commercially and when nylon stockings, being the elastic stretchy fabric that is, uh, were released, they sold out within something like three hours and there was lines around the block at all, so all major department stores to purchase them. And it's funny to me because only a few years later the war started and they discovered that nylon made excellent material for parachute cords and parachute silks and so it became this big drive to do your civic duty and hand in your stockings and as a result there was a shortage of stockings in general but women were still expected at the time to wear stockings at all times on legs. Having bare legs was essentially the same as running around topless in modern day so women got crafty as women tend to do and they made a, a new product called liquid, liquid nylons, liquid stockings. And that product was made out of a variety of chemicals. It was kind of a precursor to a fake tan. And it was applied in department stores with big uh, paddles and big, big paint brushes to your legs. And then it was set with a, um, a powder to sort of mattify it on your leg. And it was meant to last a couple of days, if I remember correctly. Um, and then women would draw on the back of their legs with, a, with an eyeliner pencil and a protractor. They would draw the seam line up the back of the stocking so that it looked like you were actually wearing a pair of stockings. And that worked great until they realized that the chemicals used to make liquid nylons were actually very effective in chemical warfare and the production of other uh, materials for war. And so liquid nylon was also pulled from the market and uh, in the UK in particular, women were so desperate that they ended up using used tea bags to paint their legs in the dark tan color that nylon stockings came in. But as a result, 
the moment it started raining, which in the UK is all the time, women would have to run, otherwise their legs would start dripping tea down into their shoes and it would start streaking all over the place. So, moral of the story is, uh, people have always been industriously recycling and reusing materials that are effective and still useful within their lives. Um, this has also been applied to things like Victory Gardens. The Dig for Victory campaign was a really successful uh, campaign used in allied uh, countries, so the US, the UK and Australia. And what they did was they called for digging for victory. The idea was that in the UK, prior to World War II beginning, a lot of uh, fresh fruit and vegetable produce was actually imported from the mainland. And so in order to protect the country from starving to death, they were making a major push for individuals and small communities to actually reuse and repurpose empty plots of land, whether that was sporting fields or uh, just empty blocks within suburbia or areas along the train lines and all those sorts of left alone parts of the soil. They were calling on communities to reuse those areas and turn them into community gardens growing food crops so that people wouldn't end up with a shortage. Because at the time, because in 1938 they were shipping in something like 60% of all fruit and vegetable produce. Um, so when France was taken over, there was again another drastic push because literally all uh, European and continental uh, food resources were insecure. You couldn't get them across the channel without threat of U-boats and sinkings. In Australia, it was a similar push because we were supplying a lot of the Allied forces with food and food crops. We needed to make sure that uh, everyone would be able to be fed. And so it was the same here, sports fields, empty plots of land, uh, people's large private gardens that we used for lawns instead were repurposed by local communities, usually primarily women. So in, for instance, Queensland, the Brisbane community of Victory Gardens was run by a women's hockey team that decided to cancel their, ga their games and instead use those uh, fixtures and the fixture times to grow fruit, vegetables and uh, flowers. And the flowers were provided to the local uh, convalescent homes and hospitals to try and cheer up the soldiers. So that was really lovely. And the only major problem they encountered was that they didn't have the transportation available to actually move the crops to the places that they were trying to give them to. You would see in the newspapers that they were asking local people to come and bring their pickup trucks to actually move those products to where they should be. So the Dig for Victory campaign is something that was really successful to the point where newspapers in the UK, the US and Australia were all complaining that it was driving down the price of food crops for, for farmers and they weren't able to make a living. So primarily the products of the Dig for Victory campaign were to feed local families and also to feed local soldiers uh, who were in convalescent homes or in field hospitals. And it also allowed people who were on the home front to actually maintain a sense of purpose, often in urban areas where they, the, the, the options are limited. So yes, World War II is rife with fantastic examples of uh, recycling and reusing items that people wouldn't even think to collect these days, let alone in the 50s and 60s when the single-use boom began. I find this kind of history particularly interesting because I think it is an example of human ingenuity and our ability to adapt and um, live life purposefully. And I think that in a single-use society, this is something that's very important for us to embrace and especially if we want to ensure that we have a minimum impact on the planet whilst maximizing our own experiences and our own ability to be creative and live fulfilling lives. That was a bit deep, wasn't it? Thank you so much for watching. I will probably be talking about this topic again because there are so many fantastic examples of ingenuity throughout history when it comes to reducing, reusing and recycling. Uh, I know it's not quite on my usual sort of topic sp scheme, but Niche history is niche history. Let me know in the comments if you'd like to see more of these kinds of videos and like and subscribe. Thank you so much for watching. This has been India and I am the History Rescuer. And, uh, home... <laughs>
to feel a little, yeah, like a mm, little if you, let's get this right. <laughs>